So it's very interesting, for example, to, to, look at, to look at the impact that China is having in Africa's this energy decision making. So in the same year, in 2017, Egypt announced two big projects, both of those the biggest in their field in the world. So they unveiled the biggest solar park, you know, energy installation in the world, um, and they unveiled the largest coal power plant in the world. In the same year, both of them funded by China. Um, so, you know, this I think is, it really boils down the challenge. Um, China is the world's, thank you, China is the world's innovator, like, like leading innovator in terms of the implementation of, of renewable energy. Um, it does incredible amounts of work on renewable energy. Um, Africa needs all of that work to happen right now. Um, Yet at the same time, um, the, you know, China built one third of, of all of the coal plants in Africa, coal power um, plants in Africa from between 2006 and 2016. And of those, three quarters were in Southern Africa. So that makes a lot of sense, right? Southern Africa has a lot of coal. Um, South Africa has a lot of coal. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a whole logic of, oh, South Africa has this mineral resource, it needs to beneficiate it, it needs, China needs to help it to use its own mineral resources to, to power South African development. All of that makes sense. Like, we, we, all, we all know that discourse. However, it's disastrous, right? Kind of, it's disastrous to, to lock South Africa into, into that development, you know, kind of paradigm for so long. And it's, it's disastrous to, to allocate that amount of resources to do that. Um, so what we, what, what we need is a radical rethink. And what, what we have is the opportunity to, to implement radical changes very quickly. So that, South Africa is the youngest continent in the world. It's, it's the one that, that most needs to leapfrog into new forms of development. China is the world's leader in, in providing and, and developing this technology. It can all be made to work. The problem is, it is the, the kind of thinking in the political world that needs to, to happen in order to make it work. And in order to do that, we need to start asking really difficult questions. Questions that, are, that Africans, I think, are extremely unfamiliar with asking themselves. So, for example, is the choice of South Africa, which has a lot of coal, or the choice of Nigeria, which has a lot of oil, the, the, the choice to use that, use that resource, can it still be only thought of as a national development priority? Or must it also be thought of as a form of crime, essentially? Like, a, you know, a, an act of aggression against the global south. And if, if one thinks of the global south as including places like the Caribbean, which is increasingly being whipped by hurricanes every year more and more, or like Bangladesh, which is extremely flooding prone and is, you know, is already seen as, you know, as, as ground zero of climate change disaster as we see it, the, cho the choice to allocate Chinese money to a South African project that uses coal can then be seen as a form of, of aggression against the global south by the global south. So, you know, in order, to, in order to move ahead on this, we need really tough thinking. Um, and we need extremely proactive African decision making. Um, and what we've seen is China tends to move, in, in, in Africa, China tends to move along with African decision making. You know, Africa, African leaders have more agency, have more agency that we, than we acknowledge, as all of the, the previous speakers have pointed out. This is an African decision-making issue, um, and it, that decision needs to be made now. It needed, needed to be made 10 years ago, actually. Um, and I think it's, it's time for, for people like us, academics, think tank people, journalists, to, to really start asking those very hard questions. Um, to move beyond easy ideas of, oh, we, oh, we have women development, or we have sustainable development, whatever that means. Um, you know, and to move beyond this kind of artificial siloing of something like climate change and national resource development or mineral beneficiation or, you know, all of these, all of these different issues that we're talking about. These are not separate issues. They are the same issue. And they all affect these young African people that we, that we profess to want to help, they will be living through the, the consequences of our decisions. Um, so I think, you know, it is the China-Africa relationship offers unique potential to start addressing these issues, but in order to do it, one actually has to do it. Like African leaders will have to step up and take those reins.
Thank you so much. We need to partner with key countries. United States is there, yeah, UK, Germany, um, China, and quite a number of other, small, even smaller countries. Um, you have Turkey, we have uh, the Middle East countries. So of all the partners that we have, China is the second uh, developed world power. It's becoming more and more strategic, and it, we seem to be achieving more um, with, on that relation. I think it has to do with the manner in which uh, this relationship is focused, the Africa-China um, um, uh, forum, uh, where the discussions are, are, are dealt with. The weakness of the continent is that the, we are too fragmented. We are 55 countries. Our infrastructure is extremely poor. We don't communicate well. We're still going to some parts of the African continent going via Europe. We're still battling with a number of key issues. In my own country, SAA is not doing well. And I listened, I just landed this morning from Shanghai at the open of the import, and I'm privileged uh, to have been there and watch. Like Moses Kotane in 1950s, where he said when he went to Soviet Union, he came back, he says, I'm coming from, and I've seen Jerusalem. Let me repeat, I also come from um, Shanghai, and I also repeat like Moses Kotan. I have seen the new Jerusalem. And in saying that, what I mean is that Jerusalem is in China. Um, it has nothing to do with anything other than to see that China has conquered the future. And that future and key issues that China has done that we need to do, and we're not doing at all, we are not organized. We don't have clear vision, and yes, individual countries and continent as a whole. We have lots of programs, but we seem not to act on them. We, our, 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 our education system, our infrastructure, our plans, our thinking, we are quite good in terms of talking, but in the implementation and action, we're extremely poor, and something has to uh, give in for us to succeed. So in our relationship with trade with China, we need to rethink, one, I'll now locate my talk on South Africa, China, is that we are tiny, small, and to put it quite radically, insignificant. We are only 55 million people. This is nothing less than one or two Chinese cities. We are tiny, and therefore, as we think we need to think in numbers, um, we cannot succeed and will never succeed if we think and limiting ourselves as South Africa. We have to think big. Therefore, SADC, the continent, are our starting point. We can only succeed if we move along with the rest. And the he conquered, we have been conquered, we have been humiliated. I mean, I want to be very frank. There is nothing unique about our history. We are not the only people in the world who have humiliated. The Chinese were humiliated, like us. Worse off, I mean, opium, the Britain selling opium in China, and it was on opening trade. China was forced to open up, um, uh, humiliated like we. So we have something in common with China. Therefore, we need to move, unite our continent, ensure that we work with China on key issues so that we have a leverage. We can't negotiate 55 million people versus 1.4 people. There is absolutely nothing we can do. China has conquered new technologies of the future. I went in Beijing to a factory where I came out, I was near in tears. I did not see one single person in the entire factory. And this is BOE, new technologies, machine, nothing else. It's quiet and there's nothing. You see products coming out, there's not even a single person. Machines are operating, and we're asked to compete with this country, with these uh, new factories. We are sleeping. If we think we spend time toy toying on the ground and uh, all the stuff. Yes, land, we need it. We need land. But land is not the only item. Education is central. We need to educate our people. We need to ensure that we focus on key areas with China where we are frank. Our head of states 
in Beijing made it clear to China that we cannot continue with this kind of imbalances in our trade in favor of China. Therefore, we need to come with answers. How do we reverse these imbalances? We have only to do that if we organize ourselves, ensure that we compete China with the import uh, show in Shanghai, 130 people are countries that are involved. China has said to the world, the next five years, we have 10 trillion US dollars. Come to us, the whole world. Tell us what you can sell to us. We'll select it and then we increase. For us to deal with the imbalances, we need to have products that Chinese can consume. As it stands, we're still selling bananas in China. And we cannot continue selling raw material to China. Bangladesh is doing the same. And Bangladesh is much closer to China than we are, geographically speaking. We have to have value-added products that we sell into China. This is where Africa needs to do. We can't compete among ourselves, producing the same material, beneficiations of our raw material. China needs our products. One belt, one road. We need to ask key questions to China and to ourselves. We want to be part to one belt, one road. But we're not wanting our raw material to be shipped to China. It has to be a whole new game that in the value chain of the one belt, one road, the Africa dimension, we want to sell value-added products going to China into the bigger global grand plan of China so that our products as the continent are sold in those areas. This is where the debate should be. We need to say to China and to ourselves that we, from now onwards, we're not interested in the noises that we hear about that trap. There is quite out of 55 African countries, countries that are not doing well. But the noise that we hear, China's debt to Africa, it's a small number. It's less than 4%. The real debt we have is Western countries. And no one is talking about that. We need to now say to the world, it's neither Washington nor Beijing. We as Africa, we want to increase our trade as defined in the AU strategic partnership plan. We want to increase more volumes to be eaten by Americans and Chinese. We want to send our students to Washington and Beijing, to Germany and to Japan. We have and don't have the opportunity to have a fight with anyone. For us to develop as a continent, we need global peace. That's what made China since 1978. There has been peace in the world. There's need stability on the global market. And with the trade wars, it will hinder our development. We need stability at that level. So as we work with China and other strategic partners, the driving point should remain. To what extent can we influence the stability of the global market? We need to buy time. We need that peace. Domestically, we need to stop the noise of wars. We need to develop our infrastructure. And lastly, Chair, we need to measure what we are doing. Our stories has always been, uh, and may, let me focus on China, and the noise that is coming from Western world, is that there's a dead trap, and when you look at the pictures, uh, there's one weakness that we as Africans, and to a larger extent, the Chinese as well. African culture, it doesn't differ from Af um, African culture. We're very humble in our approach. We don't make noise. Um, and the world we live in, it's a world of sound bites. It's a, we don't measure what we're achieving in our relationship with China. China has developed a rail from Mombasa to Nairobi. It's moving into uh, Uganda and everywhere else. The West is arguing that this is leading to that trap. And the pictures that we hear, both in Beijing and in African capitals, 
It's showing our head of state shaking hands with Chinese and the train. But that's not the real story. The real story needs to move away from this big hand shaking. Yes, it's good. It needs to move to the individual women, men, and who live along the rail. Let's measure how many people are being their lives uplifted because of the new rail from poverty. China has been able to do that, has uplifted 700 million from poverty. That's the core challenge that Africa has. So to us to measure whether our relationship with China is succeeding or failing, it should be measured by the number of people we lift out of poverty. It will silence any critique where it doesn't matter where it comes from. Our failure to do that, it remains a challenge to us as scholars. Let's measure any relation. By the way, the Americans also came to Kenyans. They said, no, no, no. We also want to build a road. And then the real road that is needed in, China, in Kenya, it's not Mombasa, Nairobi. It's Mombasa, it's Nairobi to the border of Uganda. That's where there's needed, the road is needed. Americans say, no, our road, we want it to move alongside the Chinese rail. And the, Nairo and the Kenyans have agreed. As we speak, Americans are building the road that runs along the Chinese rail. Why? Because the competition, Americans want to prove to the world why do, I mean, I'm not blaming Americans. I'm not blaming anyone else. I'm blaming Kenyans. I was in Kenya three weeks ago. I said to the Kenyans' leadership, why do you agree to that? You need to set the parameters in terms of where your road should go to. And therefore, we have to think as Africans, where, who is our partners, and how do we measure whether this relationship is successful or not? Let us not be bogged in other people's battles. We need to educate our people. We need to add value to our products. We need to enter into the fourth industrial revolution. That's where the battle that we're having at the moment. It's not Washington fighting Beijing over trade and anything. It's nothing to do with trade. The real battle that we have, it's as to do with the new technologies. And as I said in my opening, I'm coming from, I've seen the new Jerusalem. It is in China, as Moses Kotanya has said in 1950s, referring to Soviet Union in the Cold War era. The new Jerusalem that I've seen is a Jerusalem of new technologies where the Western world cannot match. And it's the technology that we as Africans are going to compete with Chinese if we don't, these institutions, I grew up here at FETS, if we don't produce new knowledge, new technologies, and spend more time in classrooms to produce and patent our knowledge, we're going to be um, a forgotten people, a dying continent. I, I close my statement, Chair. Um, as to the last session, we will also allow four questions to finish our today's exciting um, forum. Um, the rules are the same. Four questions from the floor. Introduce yourself. Be brief about your comment or your questions. And also, I, I think it's worth mentioning that I also see second generation of the new Chinese immigrants coming here to, the, to today's venue. Many of them are young graduates and uh, professionals into this country's uh, industries. So I hope to hear questions from all of you as well. Now, let's open the floor to the questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Professor Thomas Hausen from UNISA. Um, is my question or my support goes to Corbus. Um, selective reading and selective cognizance is, is the greatest threat uh, to all of us, and especially to academics. And, and the, uh, the International Climate Change Report of 8 October has been a victim of selective reading. It is being silenced. It's simply not being acknowledged. For the China Africa, for FOCAC, for the new power of the BRICS of the South, the challenge would be to make this, to put this on the agenda of the G20 meeting uh, at the end of November, end of this month in Buenos Aires. Um, because I circulate a lot around um, 
uh, other ambassadors. Uh, I've, I've, I've asked and tested everyone who was at G20 meeting, and they all said, no, it's not an issue. We're not going to discuss it. Uh, who, what, what climate change report? So um, this climate change report summarizes the findings of the 6,000 most acknowledged and rated researchers in climate change around the world. And they've come to the conclusion that if we just carry on as we are, uh, by the year 2050, uh, the sea levels will have risen one and a half meters. Cape Town, Holland, and many other places will no longer exist. Half the world population will perish, will die. So th this is being silenced. Uh, what better opportunity for FOCAC to take up this issue, a, a, an issue of humanity, uh, because it will also contribute to the soft image of FOCAC. FOCAC is not an alliance of force. It is not being enforced by armies and, or, or by coercion. It's, it's soft diplomacy. So, so I think FOCAC is the forum that could take the lead to, to address a huge global issue. One could, for instance, start by analyzing the consumption of energy around the world. The United States, with about 5% of the world population, consumes 25% of the world energy. So, so these, these are, we, we have to begin to look at these things from different aspects, and I thank Corbus for having raised the issue here. Thank you, Professor. Second question? Over there? Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Dave, perhaps this one is for you. It may be a little bit um, uh, out of, the, quest, uh, of, the, of the, the agenda of the day, but I, I think the ramifications are screaming out loud. The idea that potentially uh, BRICS may now suddenly become RICS without, without, with Bolsonaro perhaps pulling out. What are the ramifications around that? And how would that then uh, impact on whatever BRICS is trying to do. Thank you. The third one. Yeah. Okay, so since you mentioned a new generation, and I, Carol, just graduated from UCT as, as a postgraduate, um, I want to ask, like, people like us, who was born after 1994, so we are the new generation, and we are starting to enter into the workplace in South Africa. Most of us, we are either raised in China for some years and then studied for our um, high school and university in South Africa. And we are entering into the workplace now and we see all these um, Chinese companies are starting to um, invest in South Africa and to require more graduates, more Chinese graduates especially, um, to join the Chinese companies. And for us, we are facing a question that we are raised in South Africa and there's a conflict or maybe just a gap between the cultures of South Africa and Chinese companies. So I would like to know, um, how the Africa-China relationship and the future education is going to prepare us as students entering into workplace um, to fit ourselves into this workplace and to close the gap. Who do you want to ask the question to? Um, I think Dr. Dave, please. Dr. Yeah. Dave, double job. <laughs> Our last question goes there. Is it Chinese? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. that spoke about uh, climate change. There's, there's ample evidence uh, for the past 15 years to 20 years that we are at the precipice when it comes to this issue. However, at the same time, there's been this denial that has been going on. And most of the time, you find it that it's, 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 it's happening and coming from a Western academic narrative. And the reason I'm saying that, most of the so-called powerful countries in the world, have, have, have mostly Western, 
that have denied uh, and are still today debating about the seriousness of, 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 of climate change. My question to you is, to what extent do you think we find ourselves where we are in terms of climate change? Does that have to do with the intellectual uh, lack of integrity of academics who are willing uh, to jettison research, ample research that proves climate change for the sake of being funded uh, uh, by multinational corporations so that they can pursue harvesting basically uh, uh, the earth. Uh, my second question is, is to the professor that, that spoke, with, uh, spoke about uh, artificial uh, innovation and technology. True, if you look at the past 200 years, uh, specifically medical, you would see how technology, in terms of course, has helped humanity uh, and, and increasing uh, 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 life expectancy. However, that has been parallel with an increasing levels of poverty. The only thing that you can, you can do, well, let's take the past 28 years with the exception of China, that has managed to take out 750 people out of poverty. Anyone can go through the UN, uh, UN reports, the World Bank reports, in terms of increase of, of, of poverty. My question is, with that state of affairs for the past 200 years or so, has technological innovation been used or directed towards taking poor people, poor people out of poverty? Or is it still today being controlled and directed by multinational corporations which are putting profit first instead of human development first? Thank you. You've taken the liberty of asking two questions, actually. <laughs> but Dr. Van Spaden, if you may start uh, to kill the two birds first. We got two questions. Don't kill it. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, very briefly, um, I um, I completely agree with all of your your comments. Thank you so much. Um, I th it seems to me that um, that FOCAC offers an, an interesting opportunity um, to re reroute the way that we talk about the climate change challenge. Um, more, you know, I think, I think generally, <laughs> um, I, I think that, you know, the, the one, the, well, one of the biggest things that we can blame for climate change as a whole is obviously capitalism. You know, capitalism as a system has been spectacularly terrible for the environment. Um, however, capitalism is also, to a large extent, value neutral. You can, you can essentially, you know, make money out of anything. Um, if, you know, if you just kind of put your energies there. Um, and I think FOCAC offers an interesting opportunity for us to rethink the climate change uh, challenge as a form of strange opportunity in which, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of technology and a lot of, a lot of um, innovation that, that's being developed both within Africa and in China can be, you know, kind of rushed to market, can, you know, new, new companies and new people can make tons of money out of climate change mitigation. And Africa's, you know, the, the fact that Africa needs to leapfrog into, into um, development anyway, the, fa the fact that Africa needs to build a whole, a whole massive kind of electricity grid anyway, gives that opportunity to actually do that, you know, to, to, to and, and, and in, in the same moment, to gain the inside track on technology that everyone else will have to implement anyway later. Um, so, you know, so in the sense, in that, in that sense, it's actually a massive opportunity. There's a, you know, there's, there's ways of developing things like microgrids, like, you know, like rethinking what electricity provision means by seeing what we can, what we can have done at a household level, what we don't need to integrate into a national grid, for example. All of those kind of thinking, which will then translate into a set of products that people will make a lot of money out of. Um, can be fast-tracked within the China-Africa space. Um, 
more than I think it's possible to do it, say, in a northern a northern hemisphere space where you're up against, you know, kind of very very entrenched, very well funded kind of um, fossil fuel, you know, lobbies, for example. Um, in relating to the same, on, on, you know, kind of continuing the same point relating to your question, um, again, you know, kind of multinational corporations can work for good or ill, right? Kind of, they don't necessarily have to be locked into a, a you know, a, calm, a carbon economy, um, you know. But at this, uh, but at the moment, the multinational um, organisations that we happen to have, the ones that that are very powerful in the in the world economy happen to be locked into that in, into that um, economy and they need to for that reason they need to be surpassed um, and the only way for them to be surpassed is by massive amounts of of investment in new research we can then be at very high speeds be turned into roll outable turnkey products um, and, and operations so what we essentially need is a similar you know, a similar situation as, as the 1960s moon landing, you know, kind of a, a, a rich government throwing tons of money at research institutions with, you know, and, and, and in, in return offering very high status, very high return rewards for whoever comes up with whatever technology to sequester carbon, to pull it out of the air, to, you know, to do all of these things that we need to do. Um, the the the, the, the government that has proven itself the most, you know, kind of able and willing to do that so far has been China. Um, you know, it already throws a ton of money at renewables. It's the world's leader in renewable development. It, uh, its kind of future kind of technology agenda is, is quite focused on that. It, is, it doesn't have the same kind of culture war slash political divide as, as we see in lots of Western countries that tends to, to hamstring that, that kind of development. So, great, you know, like, it, it can do it. Africa needs it. You know, it, it, you can make it work. It just, it takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of political will. And the only way to mobilize those two is by making it clear that the population wants it and that the population won't stand for anything else. Um, so I think, you know, that that is the challenge. It becomes our challenge in the end. Thank you, Dr. Van Steyden. Now over to you, Dr. Manyaye, for two questions. Yes, thank you, Chair. If you allow me on this environment issue and climate change, I uh, fully agree with the report. I mean, it's quite huge, yeah? Um, but as much as I love the climate debate, I just have a few issues which I'd like to also uh, add my view. The problem we have, especially when it comes to Africa, and that's where the numbers and our students, I hope they're here, they need to pay more attention to that. We are not the worst polluters. We're still living with our forest, even though we have problems here and there. We are still doing extremely well. Now, the argument, to put it in a very simple layman, it is that the worst polluters are telling us that you need to be in the future. There's no country that has developed simultaneously with the new technology, as much as we love the new technologies. Let's look at how China has done. By the way, China has a huge problem. They developed massively in a very short space of time. And the damage to that is massive when it comes to climate. I went into the speed train from Beijing to Shanghai uh, two, three days ago. And for several occasions I've been on that train. I love the massive development which I really uh, uh, I praise Chinese. But I did not see one bird flying along this train. I did not see one bird flying. And that frightens me as an African. I live with birds at home, at work, everywhere. So, and this is what my Chinese friends tell me. They say the same thing. Learn something from us. We developed at the expense of our environment. And we need to do the same. We need to learn what are the negative impact of our environment in China. And we don't have to repeat it. However, my good brother, Kobas, we have coal. There's no country has more coal than us. Um, I won't buy the view that we need to just abandon it. We have to use coal, but not coal alone. 
we need to use coal alongside other energy, including nuclear, but in different and varying degrees. I've been in favor of the nuclear deal, but not put in part, <laughs> and the corruption minus that. Yeah. We have uranium in this country. We have to put it to use. We'll never develop until we do that. But the procurement process has to be done fairly and in open and transparent way, without corruption. So the idea that Africa become this testing ground, everyone else, the greatest polluters, America, China, and everyone else, and then we are told, you need to pause your development. You're, there's a book, Kicking the Ladder. I don't know if you have read it. Kicking the Ladder. We, we have arrived. Then you just kick the development or ladder. You need to then uh, try other elements, not... I mean, Chinese were being blamed by Westerners at some point that because they are developing, they are now eating like us, us as in Westerners. They are now dressing like us. Then it's a problem on the climate. Africans soon, our middle class is growing fast. The very same debate are coming here. But we have to think out of the box. And we need to use all energy avenues but we can do it much more smart without polluting massively. We have managed to take coal into oil in this country. I think we landed and stole the stuff from Germans, Hitler, um, in this country. <laughs> Chinese are now able to do the same, and quite a number of others. We have quite cut-edge technology in this country. We are able to do and use wisely with sensitive to environment. That's my argument. We need to use our energy. We are the least polluters of the world. The West, the Washington at the moment, is pulling out of the treaty with Soviet Union. It's pulling out of climate change. But why do we have to be more Catholic than the Pope when it comes to these issues? When it comes to democracy, we are told we have to be more Catholic than, than the Pope. We don't eat democracy. We love democracy. We need the ballot box, but we need our bellies to be full. We need to measure democracy by how full our bellies are. And to do that, we need to balance both the democratic as well as the developmental. We need to measure. Everything has to be in a measured way. And we have to be smart while doing that. BRICS, shortly, it's not dependent on countries and leaders. BRICS, even though it was as we know it, uh, it, the idea came from this uh, marketer, um, uh, what's his name, O'Neill, and he was in his defining of BRICS was very limited. It was on the Wall Street. I think we need to liberate BRICS from the Wall Street. How do we liberate BRICS from the Wall Street? It is that we have to go back to 1955. BRICS was born in 1955 in Bandung Conference. Masses, we need fairness at the global institutions, the IMF, World Bank need to change our people in fair trade. We need to go back to the old debates and the transformation of institutions of global governance and economics. We need to have factors there. So South Africa, that is, I mean, there's so much rubbish that is being written at the moment. Yeah, in the breaks, the S is small and what? South Africa, 55 million. That's not, the debate is not about that. It's not about just numbers. It's about the representation and democratization of institutions of global governance. And therefore, I think we need to sit in BRICS as a confident member of BRICS, but not just for ourselves. We need to say, we even in BRICS, we are underrepresented. We need Nigeria in BRICS. We need other members in G20. We can't be the only African country. So I think we need these debates to go forward. With, with or without a right-wing government in Brazil, BRICS in Brazil will remain because progressive forces will overtake as much as everywhere else. So even in South Africa, a right-wing government might come, not long. Um, we can't say because a right-wing government is in power, therefore BRICS is dead. Um, we have to think much more. Chinese companies and Chinese South African um, uh, I think uh, when it comes to culture and everything else, uh, we at Investor Johannesburg, the Confucius Institute, there are five in South Africa. We also receive endless calls from Chinese companies that want students. I don't think they're looking for Chinese Chinese, as in the people. They're looking mainly for people who can speak Mandarin. It's a very simple issue. 
if you speak Mandarin and understand Chinese, they prefer those uh, students, postgraduate and the like. And we, do, we can't because there are very few people, uh, South Africans who speak Mandarin. So my view is that I think there's a much work need to be done in terms of a clear regulatory framework for Chinese companies in South Africa so that they abide by South African laws. The ambassador is very clear on companies that break the law need to be dealt with in, in South Africa and on African continent. Therefore, I think more and more um, Chinese companies on this continent need to, but it goes back to the first session, it's us as Africans need to develop those laws. I don't know if, I think I've answered all questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manye. Um, Professor Liu. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Actually, it's really something I should have talked in my talk, which I don't have time for it. I do believe in innovation, and innovation can really help us to lift our poverty. And you're asking any country has done that one, and it's China. And when I was a little boy in China, I know how poor China was, actually. And even at the time in the late 90s, when I came to South Africa, China, South Africa is richer than China. Not anymore. So and by doing that one, you do what you can afford. That's why what I talk about, not high-tech research, which I'm used to, but now I'm moving to something more useful for the community. Do something people can afford. Do something normal people can be trained for. That's what we learn from our community engagement project. We started our project in, in the one we talked about in what's well, actually close to, to Indonesia. We also, also have run some other projects. What we learn is you can't speak to them as a, a, a professionals to tell them what to do. You need to motivate them, you need to motivate them to ask them to find their own solutions to take the project on their own so that they can take ownership. They are going to develop the technology they need. They are going to develop the technology suitable for them, and eventually they will be their own IP. In that way, the business will grow in that way. In that way, people will earn more money. The people with have more access to energy will have chance to, to get more jobs and to, to, to develop the economy. So actually, what we learn is the motivation and the driver of a project must come from the people who is going to benefit from it. So that's what I learned. If we can do that way, I'm quite sure innovation can really lift poverty from this country. And also, I want to also you get the chance to really sell the exercise we tried with the high school students. That's the one thing we are trying. We don't really tell them what to do. We just teach them what kind of basic knowledge are. They come up with the conclusion by themselves, which is the technology they need, how to do it, how to finance it. They are now actually come up with a business proposal. I'm asking them to try to fund their own investors or donators to fund this project. For that little money, I can fund it, but I'm asking to try to size. I'm, I'm, so our thinking is they have to be failed for some time before they really learn how to do, do it the right way. By doing that one, they are going to benefit how, for, for, for the whole lifetime. So that's the exercise I'm trying to do. So if, if possible, I'm going to use this chance. If you are interested, I'd like to invite you to give them a chance to present to you their case to see whether you're, you're interested or not. If you're thinking it's a bad case, tell them what's wrong. Ask them to improve. By telling them how to do the work, it's much better than giving them the, give them the resolution. Train them is much better than just show them. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Liu. Um, Mr. Lee, okay. our Minister Councillor, any final remark? Okay. Thank you very much. And it's indeed a good honor to be here today to meet you guys. It actually is my first public occasion to engage with the academia because it's my first month in the South Africa. But I actually, uh, I just transferred. <laughs> Welcome yeah, yeah, from yeah. all of us. Yeah, you know, I just landed one month ago and just uh, directly transferred for our embassy in Namibia. But actually, uh, Africa is not new to me because my first overseas post was in Zambia. That is between 1997 to the year 2000. So uh, maybe first I would just give a very brief uh, self-introduction. And uh, my second post actually was uh, um, counselor, political counselor in our embassy in Botswana. And last year, I transferred to our um, uh, embassy in Namibia, and this is my fourth African country, you know, th that I ever uh, would uh, uh, work in. 
So uh, the name is Nan Li, and the Mr. Councillor and uh, Deputy Head of Mission. So I'm ready uh, to meet you guys, to engage you, everybody who are interested in China affairs, in China-African cooperation. So uh, I will try my best you know, to, to contribute and to, 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 to have a dialogue with you and to, to talk anything you're interested in. Just, you know, because time is very limited, just I want to touch upon the climate change issue, as the professor just mentioned, because it seems climate change seems to be the hot topic of the second session. So uh, I just want to, uh, to reconfirm, you know, according to the FOCAC summit, Beijing summit uh, this year, uh, we launched the uh, eight new major initiatives. And one of the initiatives is focusing on green development, which I think has a lot to do with climate change. So uh, uh, a professor from the Confucius Institute as well, you mentioned a lot about you know, China's uh, even over pro pro uh, uh, production capacity in solar panels, anything like that. But sometimes I think China has uh, uh, attached great importance to, to green, uh, green development in the past few years, especially. And we invest a lot in the innovation and the technology on solar panels and green energy, especially about the, you know, for the uh, wind powers and so on and so forth. I think China now contributes a great percentage of the uh, green power production. And this percentage in China's energy generation is still rising every year. So here I think green development, green energy should be a very top priority in our cooperation between China and Africa, and China is, uh, is ready to do that. Sometimes people may be blaming, you know, uh, maybe China is producing too, too many solar panels in the world. But to the other, in the other sense, I think maybe it's a good idea. Why? Because when China is involved with the, the production of a green uh, energy uh, facilities, it hugely reduces the cost and make the green energy available and affordable in the long term. So for that, I think there's a huge potential between China and Africa, and especially with uh, South, uh, South Africa, we can work together and uh, uh, work hand in hand to unlock the potential in the area of uh, uh, green energy and green development. For that, and I think we are ready. And also the last word is still, we have now a huge blueprint and a huge working plan on the paper, but the next point is we must work hard to turn the paper into reality and through concrete and swift actions. That is delivery, delivery, delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor.